The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, guys. Well, I'm Frank J. Hackett. Uh, this is Wire IT Bytes. I'm going to try to kind of look at the IT department from a security point of view. Uh, we're going to explore a few things, see where we go. First things first, got to say thank you to all the organizers. If you haven't met these guys yet, they're hanging out there. They're selling shirts. Go talk to them. Go embarrass them. All their Twitter handles are up here. Follow them. Check them out. They're good people. And as well, you know, thanks to us self for having us. Uh, this is the first uh, B-Size Charlotte. I think it's been a good event, so hopefully this continues. Also, i got to give a quick shout out to Hi Hack. Uh, this group of guys that I hang out with. And apparently, I just turned the mic on. Um, Prime and Glitch just dropped a nice little code, iPivot. Check it out. I think you're having some fun with it. It's really easy to expand on. You can do a lot of things with it. So about me, I'm a security consultant. I'm a senior systems engineer. I've worked with Joe McRae for the past two years. I'm one of his senior rookies. And I'm a member of the Security Awareness Training Framework. If you need a project, please see this man right here, KC. KC, put your hand up. If you need something to get involved in, bug him about it. It's a great project. It has a lot of potential. We need some more members. We've we got to get the ball rolling again. So slowly but surely, but it's getting there. All right, so we have IT and we have security, right? And we know IT is not enough, I and mean, that's why we have security. That's why we all have jobs, right? So what are some of the differences in the two? Obviously, there are some major, major points, but there's also some similarities in there, so we do have a common ground. The one thing to remember, though, is that your IT is kind of, kind of going to drive your organization. If you don't have email, you're losing money, you're not getting business done. If you don't have any shared files, you don't have any big data, God forbid. Yeah, you got to have the big data, right? Very valid point. If we didn't have IT professionals, we would not have ITSEC, we would not have InfoSec. You know, we kind of spawn from IT. We're like that upper echelon, in my opinion. How boring would that be? You know? We got to give them thanks. You know, that's where we came from. So without a doubt, you give a hand to IT, they keep us going, they keep us busy. The stupid stuff they set up gives us something to work on. <laughs> it's the truth, right? So, and senior systems engineer are included because I can tell you right now, I've set some stuff up that I look back on and it's, really, I did that? Your IT department becomes the yes man of the organization. You know, you don't go to IT going, hey, could you do this? And if they tell you no, people get angry. C-levels get angry. It's, hey, I need my tablet on the network now. I got this for my birthday. I got it for Christmas. I want to, I'm only going to work off my iPad. Is, I mean, have you guys experienced that? It's mind-blowing, isn't it? Is that Cortez? Could very well be. <laughs> I love this picture. This is IT at the end of the day when security gets done with them. You know, they go home and they drink. They look at it and, well, what's the big deal? Why do we need all this security? What, what, what is this stuff really going to do for us? Well, it's an acceptable risk. We can live with this legacy system. We have to have it. And then, of course, they need their Java. Everyone needs Java, right? <laughs> This kind of speaks for itself. As security, you walk into IT, you sit down with them, they freak out. You know, we've kind of got to address that as well. We need them to stop freaking out when they see us. It's bad. On the infosec side, okay, security thinks your baby's ugly when you're talking to the IT department. That's hard to tell somebody. If you're a consultant, if you're a security for your organization, has anyone sat down with the group of IT and gone, this is terrible. Or talking to your devs. Now, why would you have that code in there? Why would you make your own crypto library? Use the established ones. 
Now, has anyone had that uh, experience? Was it fun? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun to embarrass them a little bit, right? But it's kind of, it's a little nerve rattling. It's kind of hard, you know, because no one wants to do that. The honest to God truth is that security thinks your baby's really ugly. You know, we just can't tell you that all the time. You get a security person, everyone's a noob, right? We're with that upper echelon, so everyone below us is, oh, why would you click on that? You don't need Java to get your job done. You don't have a go-to meeting every single day. I knew you would like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest thing I get from IT people, hey, we're secure, we have a firewall. <laughs> And you know what? That's what I used to say when I was only a network administrator. You know, I would talk to somebody and be like, well, you know, you could be exposed. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look, I got watch cards. They're in high availability. My stuff doesn't go down. I got three ISPs. I'm on lock. Nope. So you got your IT people and the IT pros. They're in one category. You throw in your infosec people. They're in another. But there's also that intersection, that common ground. That's what we're going to talk about. That's kind of what we're going to explore. Now, I went looking for some mission statements, and I found these two. Uh, the first one is a InfoSec mission statement. The second one is an IT department mission statement. If you read through these, they say the exact same thing. You know, it's not complicated. Everyone wants the same user experience. They want to make it better. They want to make it more secure. I don't think in this day and age anyone sets up a system and goes, well, if it gets popped, Oh well. So guess what? We have the same goals. So why do we end up fighting with each other? And why don't we make IT better? You know, they're the people that kind of drive us crazy. If they set up secure systems to begin with, it'd make our jobs a lot easier. It's just how it is. So with these goals, we all want to protect the data, we want to protect the users and protect the organization. That's what it boils down to at the end of the day. That's all we're trying to do. What you've got to remember, though, like I said, we kind of spawn from the IT people. So you've got to have a solid IT structure. You've got to have a network to secure. And if you don't have a network, you don't have anything to secure. You know, we don't, we'd still have InfoSec. We'd all be hanging out with guns, guarding a safe, you know, with all the trade secrets in it. And that would be it. So you get your solid IT going. Then you add in your secure network. What does that produce? Happy and safe users. At the end of the day, if everyone's happy and safe, we've had a good day. We haven't lost any data. We haven't been compromised. We're doing well. IT doesn't know a whole lot. Um, and it's, this stuff is mind-blowing to me. But they don't understand what the malware is actually doing. You know, they don't know it may just be a deterrent because you've actually got a rootkit. You know, it, it just, it's shocking. Um, I've seen some completely retarded network architecture over the years. You know, they've got, we got to have to have these legacy systems. Well, yeah, absolutely, but hide them behind a Citrix server or something, you know, isolate them. Uh, IT and passwords, I don't know why, they reuse them. And you would think of anyone in your organization, the IT department would just, it'd be common sense for them to have strong passwords. They don't. You know, uh, there's one place I did an audit for of their, I don't know, 300-some different logins for various things, they had three different passwords that they used. And they set it up like that, so that way when they were logging in, hey, if this doesn't work, try the next one. If that doesn't work, well, I get in the third time. They don't get locked out, and they're good. And IT has to learn how to say no. You know, when that C-level says, hey, I need my tablet on the network, tell them no. You know, you can do that. <coughs> Strictly your IT department isn't going to save you these days. You know, you can have as many blinky boxes as you want. It's not going to matter. I mean, some are necessary, right? You have to have a firewall. You know, you should have gateway antivirus. You should have an IPS. But it's not, it's not going to do everything. <coughs> you know, at this point, patching's not enough. 
Uh, you've got, look at, again, go back to Java. How many Java patches have come out in the last two months? Anyone have any idea? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, so how do you, if your security posture is, well, we're just gonna keep everything patched, we'll be fine there. Well, if you've got one box, that's feasible. You've got 10, maybe. When you start talking about 100, 500, 1,000 computers, how do you patch all those and have it dependable? You know, that's hard. <laughs> Use Linux and stay in the repos. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if we could get business to use Linux, that'd be a lot nicer, too. Um, IT, a lot of times, will say, well, this is an acceptable risk. You know, those two words should never be in the same sentence, with the exception of that one, in my opinion. You know, nothing should be an acceptable risk to us. IT can't do it. Uh, you know, every day, all these new vulnerabilities come out, new exploits. It's hard for us to keep up with the stuff, right? You know, has anyone seen like the Mimikatz Alpha? Brand new. Yeah, it's hard to keep up with this stuff. Um, you know, if it's too much, if, it's, if we can't keep up with it, we can't expect them to keep up with it. We can't expect them to have everything hardened against it. <clears throat> and the other thing, you know, IT's already got a lot to do. Uh, we, if we start piling tax onto them, it's just going to overload them more than they already are. So we've got to educate them, without a doubt. Um, in doing so, and this is something I struggle with personally, don't talk down to them. That's easier said than done, because they will frustrate the hell out of you. It's just how it is. You know, work with them, expose them to some new ideas, some new solutions. And you know what? In the process, you're going to get exposed to some stuff that you probably haven't thought of either, because it's a different side of the game. You know, when your IT's hard to train, because these are computer people. They know everything, right? Well, I've had much better success is actually going, hey, look, here's MSO 867. Here's what it does. Here's my shell. Here's what I can do with that shell. Versus, well, you got to patch against it. You know, it, it's, you've got to take kind of a different angle for training and I think make it more hands-on for them so they get an idea. You know, show them the shell and say, look, this is what ties in. It's not just that red tick on Nessus. You know, it's actually pretty bad. And why don't we audit our IT departments more? Because that's kind of where all these problems stem from, right? You know, our IT, our devs. <coughs> Go through, look at their password policies not your organization policies, but just within the IT department. You know, they should have probably stronger rules. That's how it needs to be. Uh, explain everything to them, say this is why you know, we need to correct this. A uh, company that I work for, the last year, th that's been my job, is getting them kind of more secure, essentially. Um, started off with a report and we had a meeting and we went through the whole thing. It was born as hell to me, but it opened their eyes and they got to see and kind of correlate of, well, this is why we need to turn off SSL v2. You know? uh, get rid of the idea that security costs a ton, you know, tons of money. IT never has a big enough budget as it is. So if you're trying to hit them up with ideas, they may, may just freak out that, well, now you know, I'm gonna lose even more budget, da, 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 da. As I was saying before, you can't train them, you gotta demonstrate. You know, they're, they're computer people as well. They may not have some of the same skills that we have, but they know how it works at the end of the day. If you're gonna to try to go down this route, you've gotta communicate, you know, it's key. If you're not talking to them, if you're not talking correctly to them, you're gonna have huge issues. You know, stop fighting with each other. It doesn't help the organization at all. And then kind of a, a new concept that I just saw um, it was, you know, can IT, can the help desk, can you get help from the help desk? Well, a guy by the name of Mick Douglas, which, uh, great guy, if you haven't met him. He did a uh, talk at aid called, you know, help from the help desk. Definitely, definitely, definitely go on, check this out. Uh, he's an IR guy, and pretty much what he talked about was, hey, you know, users calling with malware to the help desk, well, why don't we have them you know, kind of go through a flow, start collecting information for IR? Makes it a lot easier. So now you're getting help from the help desk. 
a really cool concept, uh, definitely worth uh, checking out. Your IT department can be their own worst nightmare. Uh, like I said before with the passwords, they literally had three of them and they just repeated them everywhere. Well, we, we know passwords are dead, right? <coughs> you know, password reuse is rampant within IT. But then you start looking at stuff like your firewalls, your routers, your switches. Why aren't they using two-factor authentication? It's quick and easy to do. Uh, where I work, you know, we manage firewalls for customers. So we've got 250 firewalls or so. To set up two-factor authentication, it literally took me five minutes to set it up on the server side. That's it. Uh, actually, the gentleman just walked in, Wicked Systems, you know, for the two-factor, it's great. Uh, I use Duo myself, and I absolutely love it. You know, if you're not using the stuff already, you should be. There's no reason not to. So again, uh, your IT department really, really, really needs to have kind of their own policies. Uh, it's something that's global. It works for the rest of the organization. It doesn't necessarily work for the IT department. You know, they should have stronger passwords. Uh, passwords that get changed, they have more to manage. You know, get them some password management software. There's an application, I can't remember the name of it. It's the coolest thing ever. It keeps track of everything. And when you need a, pa a password change, it'll actually reach out to the application or the service that's uh, authenticating with it and update that as well for you. Stupid, simple, and implement, and makes it so much better. Um, with an IT, when you bring on a new hire, it's a little bit different than someone else, you know, a new accountant, a new uh, business manager, whatever. You know, how quickly do they get access to everything? If they're IT, they gotta have it, they gotta work on the systems. But do we have a process in place? It's, all right, it's your first week. We'll give you access to passwords for this, 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 and this. You know, they don't necessarily have to be you know, domain admin to do their job. And then how quickly can you get rid of someone in your IT department? If someone gets fired, somebody quits, how quick can you change all the passwords so they can't come back to bite you? Uh, that's something we went through as well. And it was like, wow, we got to make some changes. Uh, and that's where, for us, that's where that two-factor on all the routers came from. IT is lazy as hell. You know, they'll get by, they're the yes man and they're lazy. They're going to do whatever they have to do to make the user happy at the bare level. And very rarely does any engineer go, well, I'll go above and beyond to do my job. If you can break that cycle, that's great, you know. I, and we have different goals. Security wants security. IT wants uptime. They want the reliability. You gotta kind of reach out to them. Like, look, that's awesome. You've kept the Windows Server up for 300 days, but you're vulnerable to this, 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 and this. You know, teach them it's it's okay to reboot something every so often. Every place has the know-it-all. Stay away from them. It's only going to cause you drama. It's going to make your job miserable. Stay as far away as possible. <clears throat> so if you start going down this route, and look at any organization, but there's definitely a correlation between the strength of the IT department and the strength of the security department, and vice versa. You know, if you've got a great hacker doing all your security stuff, your IT department's gonna have to rise up to meet his challenges or her challenges, right? And it's, it's the other way around too. If IT's deploying better systems, better solutions, the security side's gotta rise up because you've gotta figure out ways to break in and exploit. I mean, you're on the same team, make each other better, why not? Uh, and for consultants, this is definitely, definitely true. You know, so the security side, you do a pen test, you give them a report. If all you're doing at the end of the day is going, well, your network sucks, here's my report, pay me. You haven't done any good to that organization at all. You know, work with your IT department, work with your customers. You know, we want to make everything better, right? So you start going down this road, you may get to a point you have to relax a little bit because now you've got IT doing their jobs. So, you know, you've gone through, you've done the audit, 
you've got some better policies and procedures in place for your IT department. You know, now you're working smarter, not harder. And honestly, do any of us just want to sit around and add snort signatures for the rest of our lives? I, I can think of 10 things I'd rather do at work than that. <coughs> some of the stuff we do isn't that hard. You know, it's kind of a dirty secret. Uh, they don't need to know that, don't tell them that. But if you've got your IT department thinking in this manner now, you've kind of led them down the path of the righteousness. You know, you've got them going, so now they're gonna take the users with them. You know, that's who, your help desk is, uh, that's where your users see, that's what IT is to them. You know, so if you've educated IT, you're gonna get that trickle down effect, and now they're gonna educate your users. And yeah, if you watch Mixed Talk, you'll see this. The help desk has already seen better than security. It's just how it is. No one likes security. We're the evil people. You know, we show up and tell them your baby's ugly. Uh, they'd much rather talk to IT than talk to security. If you've got your IT department, de you know, deploying better, stronger, and more secure infrastructure, your job just got easier. You know, you don't have password 101 bang at anywhere. You don't have telnet open anywhere. You know, and if you get IT to the point where they're actually going back, and this is really cool when it happens, they'll go, huh, well, I'd set this up, but I could do it better knowing what I know now. If they're going back and fixing that stuff on their own, you've really done your job. And that stuff gets cool to watch, because then you get to see what they come up with. And if you get to that point, hey, chill out, you know, go write some new code so you can keep your IT department guessing. Don't let them ever beat you. You know, we want to make them better. We don't want to give them everything. So the kind of harsh reality of this, it's hard. Uh, people hate change. Where I work, you know, we're a 10 man shop and it's taken me a year. It's a lot of hours. Uh, it hasn't all been fun either. Um, you know, people don't like being told they're doing something wrong. It's human nature. If you start with your boss though, you get that buy-in, you get corporate buy-in. You know, you can just kind of start going bit by bit. And that's exactly what you need to do. And you can't expect everything to change overnight. It's not realistic. So definitely, yeah, you gotta tighten the screw and you gotta do it bit by bit, little by little. If you take a nail to the hammer with it, they're not gonna, you're not gonna get any uh, support with it because now you're not making changes. Now you're just redoing everything and now you're kind of a dictator. So yeah, so when you start making changes, this is how I've done it, it wasn't, well, uh, we're just gonna do it like this now, deal with it. It was, hey, let's try something for a week, see how it works. Let's try it for two weeks, see how it works. Well, you know, after a week or two, everyone's in the habit of doing it the new way. So the old way that you knew was broken, but they didn't, is forgotten about. Those sides are happy now. You know, IT knows what they're doing, security's secure, and we're good. Everyone's human, you know, even you, awesome security guru. You know, part of life. There's always gonna be some resistance there, just how it is. But definitely remember, if you have more secure IT, you're gonna have a more secure help desk, it's more secure users. That trickle down effect is awesome when it happens. You know, I overheard uh, one of our guys the other day on the phone, and he gave the best definition of a virus and a Trojan to a customer. I was, I was speechless. I actually uh, hit up my CEO on Skype and said, okay, give him a, another you know, bonus or whatever. That was good. It, it was mind-blowing. It were three months ago, the dude had no idea. So yeah, trickle-down effect is awesome when it happens. You get this stuff working right, it's gonna make your job a lot easier. You know, and again, there's nothing wrong with improving the skills of a coworker. People like careers. You know, a lot of us started in IT. I mean, that's where I got my start, and I think for most of us, that's where we got our start. You know, it's that stepping stone. So if you're helping making them better, they're gonna help make you better, better as well. Stay away from the know-it-all. Uh, there's one in every group, especially with uh, computer people. I don't know why we all get an attitude, a little chip on our shoulder. Uh, IT is not gonna save you. They can't save you. Uh, but they can definitely help you. Uh, make your job a lot easier, go from there. 
And lastly, don't be the know-it-all either. You know, no one likes being talked down to. It's just not fun. So definitely flew through that. But any uh, comments, questions, whatever, hit me up. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. People who are on the cloud, that's, that's what I aspire to be, have come up through operations, right. have done the sysadmin work, and have done, have, have been <coughs> in the IT trenches. And well, yeah, I think those people are also more likely to be willing to work with IT because they yeah. understand what they're up against. But I think that the, um, unfortunately, as security is made to seem like a sexy, attractive career. Right. You have people trying to jump straight into it. You get a couple certs in and all of a sudden, you know, I should be able to be the security guy right. when I've never done that. Um, you know, I haven't earned my stripes, so to speak. And I worry that this situation will get worse as more of those people get into the field. Right. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the best security people did come up through IT. You know, if to exploit something, you've got to understand it. You know, you, you can write, you can just start writing code and go that route. But at the end of the day, if you don't know why something works, you're probably not going to, you may exploit it, but you may not exploit it to the full potential. You know, you're definitely not going to secure it to the full potential. You can't do office, you're skinny on the blue team. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Um, why at every company do I have to have an argument with management about why I need to be administrator on my online organization? Why do I keep mm -hmm. running into why can't you be a local admin or yeah. Um, why why do so many companies have these meager policies? Well, I mean all right, so local admin. If okay. Okay. Well, now, for your organization, do you want users to be able to install whatever they want? Um, well, you can get users it's, it's, it's a tricky question, though. You can get users to agree to a policy that they will only install... Now, do you think everyone is honest? But they Right, but, but what about the stuff that gets installed you're not aware of, though? Huh? No, that's, that's I can't that's run the quality center without being local admin. It's not my fault, it's HP's fault. But I have to use quality center. Why right. do I have to do Well, you're always going to have, there's always going to be that one box that becomes an exception to any rule. You know, that's something that you may have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, and to what, what we were saying about being able to install everything, about a month ago, I uh, did a pen test. The network was really well put together. Uh, I, was, I was actually really impressed with it. Just got some cred, started moving around, wound up on the CEO's box, CEO slash president. I went, sweet, game over. I've got this person's creds. He's the CEO. Here I have access to everything. I got all the data. He didn't have access to anything, which was nice. It was refreshing to see but made my pen test a little bit harder at that point. What I did notice was he had a Dropbox folder. Dropbox was about 200 gigs. I was like, huh, that's interesting. Let's see what's in there. All the financial information, all their trade secrets, everything was in this guy's Dropbox. And what I found out after the fact, because I mean, that was, that was my pen test. I've got your bank account numbers. I've got everything. Um, found out after the fact that he uh, really didn't like that he didn't have access. He said, well, I'm the president. So he would go up to whoever he fingered for the weak person in accounting or uh, on the business management side and demand that they export and give him all this information. He'd put it in Dropbox because he wouldn't be able to look at it at home. So if he couldn't have installed that, it wouldn't, probably wouldn't have happened. Right. 
well, I, th I don't remember. I think they had opened it up just for him as well. And again, you know, it's what do you do when uh, the C-level does, it says, hey, I want to work on my iPad. And it's, well, no, we don't even have wireless. It's not going to work. You know, how do you handle that? And there's things to consider. You know, you've got to be able to say no to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big thing oh. with expectation management in general is, you know, I hear what you're saying from, from the IT side. And, you know, it sounds like they're, they're trying to restrict you into a box. But really, I think from the spirit of, of most organizations, I think most people would say that it's not a matter of you can't do this. It's what is the minimum that you need to do to get the job done. And so from a perspective of, you know, you need admin rights to run quality center, that's an HD problem, then there's got to be a way to provide an alternative solution to allow you to launch HP quality center as an admin, or if that is not possible, then they need to grant you an exception and document the risk that, number one, you have an admin access, yep. and you have the capability of installing other things Besides HP Quality Center, that could put the organization. Well, at it's risk. not install Quality Center. It's, it's running it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's not a lot of fun because they keep coming up with solutions. Oh, if we do this on the machine, it runs out of cigarettes, and it will work for a week or so, and then. Yeah, so they keep giving you band aids and not a fix. Usually, the answer on something like that is, I mean, so the first thing is you just. You, Justify the business case, like okay, I legitimately do have to have this thing, and it won't run without administrator rights. And at that point, what should be happening is somebody should be finding a way to, because really we don't want you to be the local administrator on your machine here. You shouldn't need to be. You just run that. You could maybe be spinning up a VM and operating that out of the virtual machine and do nothing else. The big issue is that you or me or anybody really shouldn't be running that on the desktop because they're touching the internet with that thing. It's gross, don't do that, yuck. Um, so if you're running this application that is just really incredibly poorly behaved and requires you to be an administrator, then usually the, the, approach, the same approach there that may or may not be happening is then encapsulate that. Now you're not doing that on your own machine, now you're doing that in a virtual machine. Hopefully maybe you don't need to go outside the network anywhere and you can firewall the heck out of that thing. And at that point, it kind of becomes a non-issue because now you're not operating as an administrator there. Mm -hmm. You're getting what you need done, but you're not exposing yourself needlessly to a lot more potential issues, which is what they're trying to do. Yeah, the challenge is not necessarily to say no. I mean, that's easy. Anybody can say no. The, the challenge for security folks is to say yes with caveats and with documentation behind it. So that if something were to happen, and this is a business decision, to, to run something in an in a escalated fashion. Mm -hmm. Something would have happened, you know, from a security perspective, we want to make sure that security has at least identified the risk. We've done everything that we can do from our technical capabilities to mitigate that risk. And then when the business says, we don't care what you think, we're absolved of all responsibility. And that's the game. Yeah. That, I think you had a comment as well? Uh, I did. The, uh, we ran into some we were Mac shop, uh, we mm -hmm. were Debian on the back end for Linux, but uh, our users are admins and they got a big problem with that. I'm not adding on my local machine either, which is kind of always a saving grace. Right. I see what my users see. Now, that to me helps out a lot because the same problems they have, I have. So I have to build real solutions to my own problem, then I also have to solve theirs. It gives a common ground. Yep. A lot of places I've seen where IT, especially, or even InfoSec, they're admins in their machines, but yet you're not allowed to be. They hold themselves to different standards. Now, I'm not, sometimes you look at all the things you have to do, and you know what? It really is the longest thing. It's holy crap. I have to solve 100 things to, to do this right. And we solve them one by one, like you said, like little by little. We had to do it for ourselves first. So before I used it, we yeah. were not yeah. admin before we implemented all the mm -hmm. apps. We did it with Mac because it was Unix based because we could use the app store modeling and stuff like that. So they can install things from an app store as a personal stuff. They have app viewers group, yep. which is great. So they can put their personal things on there and make their own to a degree. In some test cases, we're still kind of trying that out. We have a place where they can put some things on there that they purchased. We had a distribution channel through Nice. But before we did anything, my old boss was really, really adamant about this. He's like, look, if you, if we can't make this work ourselves, how can we expect 
anyone else to operate day to day without this. Mm -hmm. So we had to solve it for ourselves. We had to run it in, I think we ran around 30 Macs in a division that's now 300. We had to run one Mac in every department and fix it for the person who had the largest need, who was a businessman, who could move up with a lot of different applications. Right. And for us, you know, the answer to your situation, we solved the same. We put the application, ran it as an admin in a localized box, and they launched the application through Citrix, and it executes a local admin. You can only view that application for visibility. And also, it's available on the iPad that way, which is kind of nice for the iPad to see. Yeah. So we invested heavily in Citrix and worked with the Citrix admin. Well, that, and I, see, I love Citrix in well, times like that. that. So you work with the Citrix admin. So that's the partnership with IT that we need to do a better job of, as, as opposed to trying to solve everything. Mm -hmm. it's just, we're, we're an operations IT, we're not central IT, and we're not InfoSec to be quite honest. We're, we're not security, we aren't. We just had to learn it because for us, our platform, which is the beginning of Mac OS X, don't have a lot of InfoSec people in there. Right. And especially, it's mostly Windows for our world. There's nothing wrong with that. We like that they're really knowledgeable about that. So we have to kind of learn and then grow as well. But the biggest thing I can say that helped us out with my Associate Vice Chancellor, who is really, really high up in our organization, isn't an admin on his box. No one else in him now ever complains. Mm -hmm. And when I say my director, my boss, is not an admin on his box, the person who sits there is like, well, if he has to wait for a solution, and he does sometimes, then I can wait for the solution as well. And that's how we were able to kind of to open up that bridge of communication. And honestly, we could solve a lot more issues because it didn't just fix it for the business manager need to run the HP software, run the accounting software. They fixed it for the person who was a third shift supervisor who needed to run this piece of software and doesn't even know how to use the computer very well. It was really an idea of leveling the field of understanding, like I said before, not talking down to people, having a good conversation with them. It took us two years. It's, it's, it's a process, man. It really is. Yeah, but it is uh, but kind of what you're saying, it's like lead by example. Yeah. You know, hey, look, I'm not a local admin. I get my job done. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, applications that install without being an admin sometimes break things like a phone can be installed by anybody. Right. And then SharePoint doesn't work and you know, all these other apps. Um, and have you seen IT coming back to security to ask for to break things that are actually more secure? So I'd much rather have them running Chrome than running IT8. But you know, IT is saying or desktop we stop Chrome from being installed. You know, we only want them on the IDA for Java and Right. It's sure. crazy. But they're like, you know, put this into the content filter, put it into the, you know, the IDS, you know, put the CD recreate this thing. Have you had a response to that with the mobile company? Uh, what? End of story. Okay. Yeah. That, um, there's a yeah, there's a piece of software I can't remember the name of, but uh, allows you to launch the application and you can request to run it as administrator, and your IT department or whoever's in charge of that application has to literally click and go, okay, they can run this. Um, can't think of the name of it to save my life, but I've got one customer that uses it because they've got. Uh, business application that has to be run as admin, and that's the way we've gotten around it for them. It'd be nice. So, thank you guys very much. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. 
It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. 
uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. 
you can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.